All right. Uh, welcome back to the second part of our lecture series on the phylum chordata. So again, this is in our study of the evolution of the animal kingdom. We're in our more advanced, our last um, uh, uh, phylum to, uh, to to evolve here in the chordates. Last video series, we talked about the subphylums of the tunicates and the lancelets. And now we're going to look at the vertebrates. Uh, so in the vertebrates there, uh, most of the evolution diversity is amongst the fishes. So your uh, English lesson for the day is if you're talking about multiple fish of one type. So if I caught, you know, five catfish and they're all the same species, then it's proper to say I caught five cat or I caught five fish. If I went down to the pond and I caught um, bluegill, brim, uh, catfish, bass, crappie, then I can say that I caught five fishes. So any, if you're talking about multiple species, it is proper to say fishes. Um, so again, just your just your general English lesson for the day. So uh, as you can see here within the vertebrates there, we have 24, over 24,000 species of fishes. Uh, to me, remarkable is that there are over 5,000 species of catfish uh, alone across the globe. Um, it's coming in second here with birds being over 10,000 and then mammals kind of there, the 5,500 uh, species there. So again, this is just an overall gestalt view of the diversification within the subphylum vertebrata. Now, some targets to keep in mind for this last exam here is again, the major characteristics of arthropods, the starfish and their akin echinodermata and all the vertebrates. What gets most students is especially the taxonomy within the phylum vertebrata. There's so many, super, there's, you know, a couple of superclasses, lots of classes, uh, lots of exemplars. The taxonomy really can trip students up. So start spending some time trying to learn your taxonomy. There's just no substitution for uh, just spending even just five to ten minutes a day trying to learn that taxonomy. Uh, take it away, see if you can remember it, and then bring it back into, into your memory there. So just working with it in your working memory. Uh, today's video, we're going to look into the evolution of jaws, as well as a couple other exemplars within the fishes like sharks and things like that. And we're going to look at the evolutionary advances in respiration, circulation, locomotion, uh, and reproduction, as well as, of course, knowing the anatomy of the exemplars that we look at today. Um, so if this you find this topic very interesting, I've thrown a couple of sources here. There are many, 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 many on YouTube and other sources, but these are some of the better ones that I've kind of watched over time. Um, just remarkably very well done, uh, especially the evolution of fish. So we'll kind of, that's kind of the main topic of the lecture today. Uh, a lot of the content kind of came from there as well as some of the, the books and things that textbooks that we've read. Um, origin, origin of vertebrates, evolution of vertebrates, I mean, remarkable, uh, very well done. If you sp got 20, 30 minutes uh, and you're bored, uh, again, they're just, they're just good sources. So let's look at the vertebrates here within the subphylum vertebrae. We have nine extant classes, and extant means living as opposed to extinct, which is obviously not living anymore. Uh, the first three major classes are commonly called fishes, um, and then the other four are tetrapods. Uh, and so just looking at here, we have Mixini and Cephalospidiomorphii, uh, which are the lampreys. And so these technically aren't fishes, so my math isn't wrong with three and four. These make up the superclass Agnatha, which means without jaws. And so you may remember your some of your prefix there. A means not or opposite of. Um, and so natha being jaw, stomata being opening, right? So uh, nathostomata shown here. Nathostomata. Uh, so stomata, you may remember, is the bottom side of the leaf, that little jaw on the bottom side of the leaf when it helps the plant breathe. Natha being jaw. So opening with jaws. And this one is without jaws. Okay, so we have two classes, Mixini and Cephalospidiomorphii. This is such a weird class name that you'll probably honestly remember it anyway. It looks intimidating. It's spelled just like it sounds. Uh, and most students have no trouble remembering that. 
Uh, within the superclass Nathostomata, so we're going to look at animals with jaws. We're going to have chondromethaces, which is sharks and rays and chimeras. Uh, and again, if you've had your AMP, you may know this prefix here, chondromethacites. Our chondromet uh, is the uh, cartilage, so these are going to be animals with a cartilaginous structure. Uh, Actinioterigae, so the P is silent, Actinioterigae, array fin fish. And we have another class of fish called Sarcioterigae, which is our low fin fish. Uh, the last four classes you're probably very familiar with, amphibia for our frogs and salamanders, reptilian snakes, lizards, and crocodiles, apis for our birds, and of course mammal or mammalia for your mammals. Uh, recent studies suggest that there may be a that our best best way to say is that recent studies have uh, combined reptilian avis into one class. So recent phylogenetic studies do not even recognize repti reptiles being their own class and birds being their own class. Um, in part, looking back through the dinosaur lineage, which is kind of amazing to think about, which will be part of our third lecture series. So I look forward for that one. So looking here at the phylogenetic tree, uh, and as well as kind of the looking at years here. So our last video, we talked about the urochordates and cephalochordates, tunicates and lancelets respectively, being the ancestor to all of the uh, nine classes that we just looked at. And so while it's hard to imagine an adult tunicate, the sea squirt being a chordate, uh, you remember its larval stage had that those four major characteristics, the notochord, uh, post anal tail, uh, gill slits, and a uh, dorsal spinal cord, uh, so or nerve cord. So looking at here, we can see the jawless, so the myxini, the and the cephalospidiomorphii, those two classes there are going to be what we're talking about in just a few minutes. Uh, then we see an extinct lineage of fishes, the placoderms, uh, but within the placoderms really were a major uh, springboard, or jumping board for the rest of the vertebrates because this is where we're going to see the evolution of jaws, one of the most major uh, adaptations that had to occur for the successful lineages of the remaining vertebrates, the higher vertebrates to occur. Mm -hmm. um, so pretty neat here. So looking at uh, this simplified version of how do we get to a fish, so you may remember the ancestor to this is really between the echinoderms and those hemichordates, those little worm-like structures. And so again, it's no surprise that a tunicate larvae kind of looks very worm-like, but again, it has some of those four to five or six major characteristics that all uh, vertebrates have. The adult tunicate, again, is way different than the larval form. Uh, then we have the lancelets there, which is that amphioxus there that kind of looks kind of like a little small fish, uh, a little possibly there. And then we have this prototype vertebrate ancestor here that kind of set up the lineages for the placoderms and the sharks and other bony fish later on. So really neat here. Um, so this is, again, just showing the time period here. Don't want you to focus too much on um, memorizing these time scales. All right, this is an evolutionary course per se, uh, even though evolution is kind of the lens at which we're viewing a lot of this. Uh, don't focus in on trying to memorize these uh, dates and eons and things like that, uh, or even the order for that matter. It's just kind of a placeholder. And so what scientists have done is, as you see in the um, Ordovician here about 440, 450 million years ago or so, in the age of the fish. And so basically what they've gone is a fossil record, kind of the animal or the uh, that's made the most or has the most um, samples is kind of how we've kind of broken it up over time. Uh, so the fish, you can see kind of bland plants made their, their way onto uh, the terrestrial life. It took us a long time, about you know, 100 million years or so, before we went from fish to amphibians, and then the jump from amphibians to reptiles, and then again you can see about 100 million years or so uh, from reptiles to dinosaurs, the KT extinction boundary there, uh, which is uh, right around the end of Cretaceous, setting up essentially the age of mammals, which will be later on. So 
pretty neat little, just a little illustration there. Again, another uh, simplified phylogenetic tree. Again, just setting up what we're talking about, how we got there, right? So again, the ancestral jawed fishes. So we're not looking at uh, lampreys and hagfish per se. Uh, so we got placoderms, which really helps set up the evolution of our jaws. And we'll talk about uh, just how remarkable that is. The earliest ancient fish there still alive are the uh, chondroitheses. So all of our cartilaginous uh, fishes like the sharks and chimera, and chimera or chimera, chimera, chimeras. Wow. Um, you have your bony fish and low fin fish. And uh, it's from the low fin fish that the tetrapods evolved from. So we'll look, keep looking at that together. Okay. Put myself back up here. All right, so um, looking through here, looking through here, um, looking at the early chordate ancestors. So this is that proto vertebrate here. Uh, this is a fossil uh, that goes back to about even before the the Ordovician, uh, the, to the Cambrian, 500, million, 500 to 550 million years or so. Uh, and you can kind of already, this is just artistic representation of that fossil there, uh, but kind of already start to see some very similar characteristics that we look at when we look at the hagfish. Uh, so fish were one of the first vertebrates to evolve. Um, the beginning of them were jaw jawless and the and covered in armor plates. And why do you think that they would have to evolve um, some type of protective covering. What else was in the ocean that they would have to essentially need to devote resources, um, especially if you think about it, they're jawless, so they're essentially either filter filters, filter feeders, or they're just kind of uh, making these little uh, like vacuums when they open their mouths, like some like a giant grouper does today. Uh, so how can they do this, uh, or why would they do this? And that's because that. Uh, while the Devonian was the age of the fishes, there were other animals in the ocean like squid and other types of uh, mollusk and other uh, organisms there that could attack these uh, at will if they weren't jaw or if they weren't armored. And very much along the evolutionary front, you have prey and then essentially a predator evolves to eat that prey. Uh, and so we're going to have filter feeders and again, Kind of sucking on the bottom if you've ever seen a sturgeon uh, today, heavily, heavily armored, um, and they have their mouths on the bottom. That's just kind of filter feeders there. So let's look at the evolution of jaws. Again, one of the most significant innovations in our vertebrate history. And why is that? Why is or what created, or I should say, why is the jaw so pivotal? in our vertebrate success. And so one of the answers you probably got or thought about is for eating, right? So again, I've got a shark here eating a uh, seal. I'm not sure if it's a real seal or if it's one of those uh, man-made ones to try to get them to strike. Um, but again, so yes, it is for eating. And it now that we can eat and how we eat, we just open up a tremendous amount of possibilities that we otherwise wouldn't have if we were essentially, uh, if our jaws did not have the, for one, if we didn't have jaws at all, or jaws were very limited. And so now with the evolution and adaptation of jaws, now we're able to specialize it um, in such a ways, kind of like our arthropods, where we talked about where every little part of their mouth was specialized. Uh, and so we can eat that. Now we have some for defense. Uh, if you think about the swordfish, the one with the um, the long nose, it looks like a little claw or a, like a like a uh, saw. And so, how did these adaptations come to be? Uh, for a long time, and honestly, it still is to some degree some type of mystery. Uh, but let's look and see what makes up a jaw first. So, as of right now, there's there's several major hypotheses. I'm going to look at three, uh, the uh, three of them. So looking at the what makes up a, draw, a jaw, you have uh, these again. These are our cartilages. Looking at cartilage structures here, you have a, a palatal quadrate, which is a upper jaw, 
and a Meckel's cartilage. So together, these two major structures here, the uh, palatal quadrate and the Meckel's, Meckel's cartilage, kind of make or form your upper and lower jaw. And you have two structures behind them that are going to give them support, the hyomandibular and the serratohyal. So both of those structures are there for supporting the opening and closing, or will be the opening and closing, of the uh, palatal quadrate and the Meckel's cartilage. And so looking at these types of, these four major structures, we have three major hypotheses that have developed on how these structures got here. Um, the classic is, the classic evolution of jaws is uh, essentially that kind of goes on the idea of the cell phone that we talk about. So the very first phone obviously was like a landline, right? And then we go to the back phone and then our early cell phones, they had these big long antennas. And then over time, we finally, finally, finally evolve and adapt until we get to, you know, something like an iPhone that is smarter than what we put them in on the moon, as they say. And so with that idea that we simplify or we modify, I should say, what's already in existence um, with that with that premise there, is that the classic uh, evolution of Jaws view is that the skeletal rod or skeletal arches or uh, gill arches became modified to uh, develop the jaws. So the first gill arch is going to become the flat brain case and that brain case is going to make up the neurocranium. So both the palatal quadrate and Meckel's quadrate kind of uh, fit there in this neurocranium structure. Uh, the second gill arch is going to become the palatal quadrate, and the lower jaw comprised of Meckel's cartilage. So our second gill arch there, so this one here, this shows the second one. So Meckel's cartilage and the palatal quadrate. And then the third gill arch is then going to be further modified into the hyomandibular and the serrato hyal of the lower jaw and throat. Uh, and there's evidence for that uh, by nerve innervations and embryological evidence, uh, but there's not been a lot of fossil evidence or that transition uh, to date. But we know that the fossil record is not complete, uh, so there is some bias in that. Uh, but again, that's kind of what most textbooks and most, like in the classic uh, evolution of jaws there, that they essentially came from modified skeletal rods or gill arches. Um, there's another major evolution uh, of jaws hypothesis out there, and that's one that's known as heterotopy. Heterotopy, hetero means different, topy being place. So these, this hypothesis is essentially saying that jaws came from a different place. Okay, so uh, what we have is we have an isolation of embryological stem cells in the lower jaw. And so you may remember it in our genetics unit. If genes are expressed, and our genes are not, or essentially I should say this, that all uh, cells have genes, have all the genes in them, right? So our eye cell has the ability, it has the genetic structure to make hydrochloric acid, but it doesn't get expressed, right? We don't want to cry hydrochloric acid, but our eye cells have that gene in them. And so what this uh, heterotopy hypothesis states is that the lower jaw has the or uh, adapted or uh, mutated the ability or the stem cells became expressed only in the lower jaw and further modified. If you look at the, hang, uh, the lamprey here, the lamprey's jaw is upper and lower is always ex is continually expressed making this ring-like structure, this mouth-like structure that's a full ring, like we see on lots of animals uh, today. And so there's evidence in that, um, that again, it's an independent gene expression, and it's not in a modification of gene arches. So again, this is coming from a study in 2002 uh, from Cohen there. And uh, basically what we're looking at is those embryological Hoxbox genetic supports. So we've talked about the Hoxbox genes, before, remember in Drosophila, those fruit flies, the, the way that the exons are coded, the genetic region that goes to the ribosome, the order matters. And so in this structure here, they're able to isolate these Hoxbox genes in the lower jaw and see that in the jawfishes, they're highly um, activated and the upper jaw is not. 
Uh, and so that's just, again, that's more of the genetic evidence that possibly it was not a modification of the gill arches, but more on the genetic structure. Uh, the last one is kind of more of a um, figuring out, like, why would a fish want a jaw, right? So, again, uh, not always the best way to put together a piece of puzzle, uh, but like you said, uh, the mass Singer is on right now. So, like, as you're trying to figure out some of these artists, like, why would an artist want – why would a superstar artist want to go on this show? And so uh, as you're reading, as you're, you know, as they're going through all this, you know, some of these, in my opinion, don't make sense because it's like, come on. It's like this guy's already, you know, on tour. He got a hot, you know, he's number one artist, yada, yada, yada. He wouldn't be there. Uh, and so um, I say all that to basically say it's not always the best way, but it does sometimes give us a, a method to start. And so in the ventilation hypothesis, uh, it kind of goes along with the gill arches, but it wasn't – the initial thought was – that the end goal, for one, there is no end goal in evolution, but the adaptation was not to feed, but to help ensure and acquire more oxygen. And if I can acquire more oxygen, I can have more energy, right? Uh, or have the ability to essentially get more oxygen so my circulation is better, uh, my digestion is better, all these things. And so what basically happened is you have a breathing jaw. That would shut the mouth whenever these ancestral fish exhaled to make sure that when they breathed, that water was only going out of their uh, gills and not in their mouth. And so if you think about it, we kind of have that same type of structure. Now, when I swallow, I cannot breathe at the same time. So there's a little – There's maybe some of you may know there's a little flap there. And when I swallow, like I just did there, uh, a little flap closes, closes my – trachea, my windpipe, so that the saliva doesn't go down my windpipe. Uh, in much the same way, they essentially, this throat, um, this throat draw, breathing draw, then became modified once it was going from essentially no jaw list to these baby steps, to this breathing jaw, to finally eating jaw, um, that possibly that was an adaptation there. So again, um, lots of different hypotheses out there. No true um, enough evidence to support anything because, again, science is always continuing. We're always trying to learn new things and build on top of what we already know. Uh, and so uh, as far as which one is correct, I don't know. You decide. You look at the evidence. You make the decision, and you decide. Uh, so let's look at how these or where these jaws first began, and that began in these early extinct uh, fishes called placoderms, or what scientists call placoderms. They're typically very heavily armored uh, around the head and trunk there, tend to be generally flat as well. So we've seen some dorsal eventually flattened before. No true teeth. Uh, the nodal cord is persistent, which is amazing to think that you can see that in their fossil record. It's just an artistic representation of what some of these may have looked like. Uh, so you may have seen some... Um, Early films and things like Ice Age and things have some of these types of structures or fish in there, right? Um, within the fishes, there, we major another major adaptation is in their fins, and it helps them move. So their caudal fins, their pelvic fins, pectoral fins, all these types of fins help them swim, move, evade predators, uh, eat faster, you know, swim, burst, whatever. Uh, scales for protection, but not all fish have scales. For protection, right? So again, a lot of times your catfish are just um, smooth skin. Uh, gills, obviously, a huge adaptation, but we've seen those in other types of organ organisms in classes before. And so again, there are lots of fish without, or with some of these exceptions. I just named the catfish for one uh, for the scales there. Um, so moving forward through the extant fishes today. So what we have today. The first class, again, is Cephalospidium morphii. That's your lampreys and your mixini, your hagfish. Uh, your other fishes are chondrinthesis, your cartilaginous fishes, the osteoithesis, or um, your bony fish, and then you have uh, your ray fin or your low fin fish as well. So let's look at the super class uh, Agnatha. And look at hagfish. These guys are just absolutely remarkable. Uh, for one, the way they look. I'm pretty sure you probably have seen this if you watch Doom. Um, 
I think it's Vin Diesel. I'm not positive now that I say that. Um, uh, but anyway, the, so you've seen these types of structures, or you think these um, Hollywood has, has used these for sure. So these are strictly marine, so strictly ocean salt water. There's no bones. They have this rasping tongue that we've seen mollusks. So they have these rows of teeth like, no lateral line, which we'll talk about what the lateral line is. Uh, five to 15 gill pairs. S open circulatory system with six hearts. Um, not lots and lots of slime glands. They're just going to secrete just an inordinate, a copious, just crazy amount of slime and mucus. Um, they are dioecious. Um, eggs are in the sea, and then kind of like the spawning there. Uh, thought to feed on dead and decaying fish, uh, but they have found um, only in the digestive tract. So let me show you a quick video here. Um, of these hagfish I'm back out of here just so you can kind of see for one their slime let me show you this video here of just how much slime they make just persuade one of these guys to come and say hello and actually if you look you can see along the side these tiny white holes they look a bit like mouth holes actually and that's where it makes the slime to protect itself. Yeah, anytime it's touched, it's just going to secrete just crazy amounts of slime. Such a big tank. Apparently, just one of these fish can make enough slime to fill a bucket of water in seconds. But the question is, why? So let's look at kind of what they do, how they eat, and why. At the bottom of the ocean dwells a bizarre-looking creature. A fish so ancient, it has remained unchanged for 300 million years. This is the hagfish. Its velvet smooth skin lacks scales and slithers along the ocean floor. It has a skull, but no spine. Tiny holes run along the sides of its wriggling body. Some for breathing, and some for sliming. But its most bizarre feature is its mouth. Like something out of an alien movie. This jawless maw is made for mincing up dead bodies. Multiple rows of sharp teeth are packed on two bony plates. With its single nostril, it picks up the sweet scent of death. A feast has arrived. It has no fins, but its paddle-like tail makes light work of swimming. The hagfish latches on, and its mouth goes to work. Flesh is ripped from yeah, the carcass no and shoved down its toothy throat. Soon, it's a frenzy of multiple mincing mouths. And to keep other hungry onlookers at bay, the hagfish excrete copious amounts of slime into the water. A shy shark snatches one. Check this out. But ends up with a mouthful of snot instead. <laughs> In minutes, the hagfish will strip the carcass to bone. Crazy. It may be months before they find another meal like this. So for an animal with no jaw, it certainly made quick work. Uh that maybe looked like a mackerel. I'm not really sure what uh, what kind of fish that was going down. Um, and so again, just just a remarkable, remarkable 
animal there. So again, you just saw how much slime was made from those slime glands. So why do you think that is? Why do you think a hagfish would be a, a benefit of producing that much slime? Absolutely. Uh, if you think about it, it's again, you saw the shark there. As soon as it ate it or tried to bite it, it just like just got so much snot in its mouth. And who wants to eat a whole bunch of snot, right? Nobody. And so it's just a remarkable adaptation. These guys have been, as far as we can tell, roughly the same. Uh, their, their patterns of history, everything's about, about the same for hundreds of millions, millions of years. Remarkable, remarkable, uh, successful uh, hagfish there. Another one of the uh, agnathans there, these jawless fish, is the lamprey. So that's in that class, Cephalospidiomorphii again. Uh, and so these guys here uh, lack paired fins. Oh, there's a hagfish there. Here's the lamprey on the bottom. Uh, the, the lamprey is parasitic. Okay, so here's its mouth. Um, and so again, it's uh, andromedous, which means this is a new vocabulary word here. So an andromedous fish, uh, they're in the salt water with adults, and they go into fresh water to breed. So think about salmon. That's probably the best example that we're most familiar with are andromedous. So they're in the adults, they live in the ocean, and when it's time to breathe, they're going to go into the fresh water uh, to feed there. Uh, and so again, very, like I said, just remarkable for no jaws. Very, very, very good at what they do. Uh, check this video out from Jeremy Way. Uh, and just how uh, how awesome these guys are at latching on. And you can see their little tongue there. They're going to sit this little tongue on this little battering ram and just pop. Pop, and they're going to begin to scrape off scales and living flesh because, again, they're parasites. So they're not um, uh, scavengers like the hagfish. So check out Jeremy Wade here. The parallels with vampires are striking. They both tap into that same dark place, the primal fear that they'll drain the life force from us. Little dramatic. I've waded through their writhing bodies in a trap built to eradicate them. Now I'm going face to face, fang to vein, with a real living vampire. <laughs> and that's a strange feeling. That's a very strange feeling. It's, there's suction, but there's something sharp going on as well. Yeah, it's just mouth. Ah, it's really getting stuck in there. Oh. <laughs> the thing is, if you get these things attached, you're actually going to want to get them off. If you're swimming, you're needing your limbs to keep you afloat, to keep you moving. So what are you going to do? You've got these creatures attaching to you. Do I carry on swimming with maybe more and more attaching, or do I stop swimming and try and get these things off? Ah, easier said than done. Uh -huh. Ah, ah, come on. That is hard to get off. That is hard. Mm -hmm. That is hard to get off. Ah, ah. That's a ticky. I don't know if there's a mark there or not. Oh, yeah. Hopefully there's not a big red hole. <laughs> that feels a bit sore. I mean, these things are like aquatic vampires. I don't think that's an experience I want to repeat. Yeah. I think I've seen and felt enough. So again, just crazy, um, crazy fish uh, to think about for sure. Uh, so some lamprey characteristics there. Uh, again, we saw that rasping tongue. You saw the blood dripping off of uh, Jeremy Wade there. That was from that rasping tongue there. Uh, no bones. You may can kind of gather that from just the way that the uh, organism is just kind of moving around. Its nose is, interestingly enough, on the top of its head, uh, very well-developed eyes, a lateral line system. And so a lateral line, as it lateral meaning going side across or sideways there, uh, runs there. And it it's, has a huge advantage when we talk about sharks, uh, especially sharks. Uh, basically, it's sensing. And so uh, it can sense um, changes in water pressure and speed. Uh, it essentially allows the animal to know where it is at all times in time and space. Um, this uh, pineal, pineal eye, I believe I'm saying that right, 
um, is kind of a weird. We actually have uh, remnants of this as well. This is this sixth sense, uh, if you will, that if you're uh, into the um, psychic, reading, psychic readings and things like that, um, somewhere some of them will say they draw their strength from. Uh, you saw the gill slits or seven pairs of gills on its neck there. And again, we talked about the vocabulary and drominus where as adults are living in the ocean and then they come into the fresh water to spawn and breed. So a uh, really unique organism there. Um, for time's sake, I'm sure you saw some of the reminders that I have coming up here. I'm actually going to stop here with the agnathans and the uh, evolution of jaws. I think we're at a good stopping place here. So I'll kind of pick back up on the from the next video series the, the evolution of sharks the adaptations the anatomy and how we go from sharks to bony fish to low fin fish and then finish up the the last video so i have two more video series here to go uh, on the evolution of tetrapods so again um uh, hope you enjoyed and if you need me feel free to contact me so you guys are awesome